Hi guys, it's Mark Zikri of Space Command, and uh, I am back with Elaine from England and Wales, and we had a great time. I'm going to share with you some things uh, from our wonderful trip, and uh, including that great Laurel and Hardy sculpture that we got. I'm a huge fan of Laurel and Hardy. I've always loved them. They're, they're sweetness personified. If you've never heard of Laurel and Hardy, you have missed out. Go on, go on YouTube immediately and watch their work, particularly from the 20s and 30s. Uh, you know, and you'll you'll be very very rewarded with mirth, and uh, it'll also touch your heart. So, um, a lot of stuff is coming uh, soon. We're finishing uh, what we call 101 and 102. The first two hours of Space Command is ship out the Blu-rays and DVDs. If you haven't gotten yours yet, uh, just go on to spacecommandseries.com. We'll have I'll put a link down here, and we'll and you can buy buy it. Spacecommand-series.com. And uh, we're going to have a premiere at the, at the Chinese Theater, red carpet premiere, very shortly. And we're shooting more. We just we're met at our studio with our team where we're putting together the alien spaceship. And I went to a conference the other day and met the presidents of uh, drama, uh, scripted drama for um, Netflix and Paramount Plus and Showtime and HBO and the Roku channel and on and on. It was great. AMC. Uh, many of them knew me and the ones that didn't... Uh, now do and uh i uh i had a great time and we're now actively pitching space command and the showrunners network so that's and i'll be doing videos going into much more detail but right now i just kind of, kind of want to share with you a few of the uh things i got on the trip that i may not have shared with you before because they were being shipped uh to us but um as as you know london is one of my favorite places in the world it's like a second home to me and uh, it's always fun to go there, the antique fairs and all sorts of things. There's just amazing things to find. I'm a huge Anglophile. And then also we went to Heian Wai and spent some days there in Wales. And that is a bookstore town, antiquarian and secondhand books to, to die for. So, so let me just share a few items with you. It's going to take a few minutes because we have so much cool stuff. First of all, this is a Dutch uh, album from the 19, early 1930s, like 1931. And basically that's all these stars from America and Germany. And it was put out by a um, company that made cocoa. And you would get, each time you bought a, co you know, a, a container of cocoa, you would get one of these movie star cards and you could put them in this album until you had the album full. But it also has some, you know, photos, big photos of some of the wonderful stars of that era. And here, as I mentioned, Laurel and Hardy, here they are holding the, the, the Van Houten cocoa mix. If you look, you'll see it. And so uh, to promote Van Houten cocoa. So uh, so I'm going to put that, I think, up on the wall. It's so nice. And, uh, and then you have stars like Bridget Helm, who starred in Metropolis. And, uh, and, and just, and, and Greta Garbo, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And some are known still today and others not, but Conrad Veidt, who is the villain in Casablanca, and he's also in Cal Cabin of Dr. Caligari as some dam somnambulous Cesar. And uh, it just, it just goes on and on. It's, it's a wonderful little item that I just bought for a few pounds and uh, very evocative of its time. And uh, here's the R Gang comedy comedies the little rascals and that's jackie cooper who would later play perry white in the uh superman movies with christopher reeve and also <clears throat> of course he was in movies like the champ when he was a kid and this is like 1931 or so when he was just starting out so and they're holding the van houten cocoa tins as well so that's uh they're very much on brand so that i got that and then over here I, this was a cool thing i found this is a drawing of a tank, a British heavy tank that a little boy drew in 1940 when World War II was on. So this is just a little kid, like I would have drawn a spaceship when I was a kid. He drew a tank because that's what he was seeing. And, uh, and that was when the war was, was happening. Uh, beyond that, I got some very cool science fiction paperbacks and other paperbacks. Here's Operation Future. So if you can see that, it's very cool. And it has stories by um, Theodore Sturgeon and Ray Bradbury and um, all sorts of folks, Clifford Simak, Jack Finney, Lewis Paget, Isaac Asimov, the great writers of the 50s. And of course, that's a great cover. This is the uh, first paperback edition of On the Road, British, British paperback 
or Jack Kerouac, and that's, if you've never seen what Jack Kerouac looked like, he looked like that. Certain writers look like exactly right for the kind of stuff they write. He looks perfect. Uh, Harlan Ellison had a good look, and uh, Ray Bradbury, of course. So uh, this is a paperback we talked about John Wyndham the other day, this wonderful British writer. This is a co uh, short collection of short stories. Jizzle, not the best title, but it's, uh, I think they're trying to put him in sort of the John Collier mode of a writer where he's kind of fantastical and sat satirical. They're definitely not lumping him in with science fiction writers. This is a, an attempt to package him much more mainstream. Uh, and then a moment ago, we were looking at the, uh, the Van Houten um, little, little souvenir album. And that guy right there is Al Jolson, 1931. Al Jolson started the first talking picture, all talking, all singing. And that was, of course, the jazz singer. And he followed that up immediately after with The Singing Fool. And this, they used to come out with books, novelizations of movies, like they do nowadays, but even more so in, in these hardcover editions. And this is The Singing Fool. There he is with Sonny Boy. He sings a great song about Sonny Boy. And I guess his wife resents him because that's the wife on the other side of the cover. And uh, this was, I found this in Wales. And it's, again, quite wonderful with a dust jacket, original dust jacket. And um, Elaine's a huge fan of Tennessee Williams as I am. And so we got this terrific short novel of uh, Tennessee Williams called The Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone. And interestingly enough, this cover was drawn by Cecil Beaton, who was one of the great costumers and costume designers, very renowned figure. And this, of course, also is uh, from 1950 or so. What's the date on it? 1950, exactly. So this is the first British edition of this. Really nice. And many of you know that I love Ed Emshwiller, the famous 1950 science fiction artist. And here's one of his cool covers, King of the Fourth Planet. And <laughs> he would play a lot around with um, different color schemes, things that were eye-catching. And that certainly is Robert Moore Williams was a science fiction writer of the era. And then this is an ace double, so, you know, it flips over and it's got more like a scenic thing with a spaceship. And, uh, but I, I, like the, I like this one, the face. And, um, and um, his uh, son, Stoney M. Schwiller, has given us rights to, uh, to make props and other things from his dad's designs. And I'm very grateful for that because I love Ed M. Schwiller's work. Let's see, what else do we have here? Now, sometimes they would have completely different covers on a British edition. So this is The Caves of Steel by Isaac Asimov, and it's about a human detective who's paired with a robot detective. So I assume the one standing straight up is the robot detective. Then it's got this kind of lurid thing on the back that reminds me of uh, the movie 1984 from the 50s and Edmund O'Brien. But... Uh, but this is eye-catching and cool, and it's a, it's a good book, too. I've read it. But sometimes they would take um, covers, well, we may get to that, where they would take covers from American science fiction novels and put, on, put them on a completely different book. And uh, I'll, I, I think I'll, I have one right here. I'll show it to you in a moment. Now, also, if you've seen the movie Annihilation or the Tarkovsky film Stalker, you are familiar with the Arkady brothers, Arkady and Boris Drugatsky, who uh, wrote this great book, Roadside Picnic, that was made into the movie Stalker. And uh, they're uh, uh, Russian brothers who were science fiction novelists, and this is one of their great, great works. I was actually approached by Roland Emmerich to uh, script a movie of this many, many years ago. And uh, so I read it, I really liked it. it. Its notion is basically aliens come, leave behind artifacts and depart, and the artifacts have weird powers, and and are also kind of dangerous. It's very much like like the movie Annihilation, which is clearly inspired by it. But uh, the idea is that it was the aliens had maybe like a roadside picnic and just this is their the litter they left behind. They didn't care at all about humanity, didn't want to contact us. But this is a new, um, they have these great SF Masterworks books in England. And they this is a new translation of this book. And it also has a very interesting um, afterward by Boris Strugatsky talking about how long and how difficult it was to get the Soviet government at the time to approve this book. It took like a decade. And, uh, and, there, and it was ridiculous bureaucratic nonsense. But this is a really cool book. And let's see, what else do we have here? This is On the Beach, first British, British edition by Neville Shoot. I'm getting a, a reproduction dust jacket. It's, if you've never read this book, it's, it's, pro, it's one of the best after the bomb stories. It was made into a terrific movie with um, uh, Gregory Peck and Ava Gardner and uh, uh, Fred Astaire. 
and Anthony Perkins. It's a very dark, but very, very, very good book and movie. Neville Shute was an Australian writer, and uh, this is my favorite of his books. Very dark, very sad, but very, very, very good. Um, here's a British, another British paperback with a great cover of Earth Foretold by Kenneth Bulmer. Look at that. It, too cool for school. These are all 1950s paperbacks. And The Transposed Man by Dwight Swain. Look at that. <laughs> I just love these cool covers. This this book, sometimes they would have American books that would then, then just be repriced for the British audience. And again, this is like 1950s, and maybe 1960. Flesh by Philip Jose Farmer. And it's got a great ad line on it. It's the secret dream of every man was his. Unlimited opportunity, inexhaustible ability. Wow. I mean, can you imagine seeing this in like 1960 or 1959 saying, wow, hot stuff. And on the back says, flesh, spaceman by day, monster by night. Wow. The, never before published in any form, flesh is the newest novel by one of the greats of science fiction, Philip Jose Farmer. Wow. And later he would win the Hugo for uh, for the first of his River World novels and uh, uh, To Our Scattered Bodies Go. But this is what he was doing earlier on. And he was uh, just one of the writers uh, laboring to make a living uh, because science fiction novels at that time paid very little, maybe a thousand or to three thousand dollars. And uh, and so these guys were just struggling to make a five cents a word, um, you know, a penny a word uh, for short stories. and few grand for a novel and uh, they would have maybe a few thousand copies sell now it's a very different world this is another great cover for sci-fi one from Armada again probably 40 or 50 years old that cover um, I've told you before how much what a great fan I am of journey into space a terrific BBC radio serial by um, Charles Chilton about a group of men who go to the moon and then thence to Mars. And back then you couldn't, uh, even recording a radio show was very, very difficult. They had reel-to-reel -reel tape maybe back then, but uh, but you couldn't, you know, it was very difficult to have copies of these things. So they, they wrote novels of, so if you were a fan of the show, the radio show, you could have it in a novel form. And so Charles Chilton adapted it into this novel. Gr another great cover, this is 1950s. Uh, now, interesting enough, there's a, a science fiction writer who went by the name Murray Leinster uh, in the early, you know, to mid-decades of the uh, 20th century, and his real name was Will Jenkins, and you almost never find books with his, with his real name on them, but this is called Destroy the USA by Will F. Jenkins. So it's, uh, wow, Washington, D.C., General George C. Kenney declared today that in a future war, the United States would be the first target and envisioned a transpolar aerial assault by the enemy. Wow. And uh, it's pretty, um, pretty amazing. This is about, you know, Earth being destroyed in a nuclear war. So it's uh, very lurid and cool, and it's from a publisher, uh, some, some little tiny publisher. I've never seen this book before, so I got this in, uh, in Wales. And here's A Fall of Moon Dust, which is a really good novel by Arthur C. Clarke, of, who, of course, who did 2001 A Space Odyssey. This is about a moon bus taking a tour of uh, of the moon, it's in the future where you can have tourist excursions, and they fall into a sinkhole and they're trapped under the sand of the Martian soil. And it's will they be uh, found and rescued before they run out of air? And uh, it's a it's it was made into a really good radio adaptation by the BBC, but the novel is is excellent. I can highly recommend it. Very um, real seeming. Also found this book by William Gibson that I've never read, Count Zero. He, of course, wrote Neuromancer, and I met him years ago when we were doing a signing, and he leaned in and, uh, close to me and said, how do, I, how do I get into the movies as a writer and uh, movies and TV? And so we talked, and it was charming. And uh, I'm a big fan of his version of Alien 3, very different from the movie, the movie that was made. And uh, we have it on Mr. Sci-Fi where you can actually watch it. And uh, as, an, as sort of an animatic, it's really, really, really cool. And then this is, a, this is an edition of The Invisible Man, <clears throat> by H.G. Wells. And the cool part of the, about this book is it's got an introduction by his son, Frank Wells. And so it talk, it's him talking about his dad. And I love books that have some little link to the past, either a signature by the author or by someone who gave it as a gift to their child or to a student or, you know, other bits and pieces. And this, this has a little thing on the front called The Grace. And it says, Dear Guest, 
You are most welcome to browse through our library and enjoy our books, but please return them to your room or to the library before you leave. Should you wish to finish reading a book after your departure, please notify reception who will provide you with a self-addressed envelope in which to post it back to us. Now, this, uh, this could easily be 70 years ago. Uh, I, I can go online probably and see if they're still around. I can call and say, you want your book back? Uh, we'll, we'll find out about that. So let's see, what else do we have here? Now, I'm a huge fan. Many of you know that one of my favorite books is The Lost World by Arthur Conan Doyle. In fact, on the trip to England, I bought a deluxe first edition. But he wrote a sequel to that with Professor Challenger and the other characters from the first book. And this is the first edition of that sequel. It's called Poison Belt. And it's about Earth passing through a belt of noxious gas that theoretically will kill everyone on Earth and how they face their last days. And uh, it has Challenger and his wife on, the, on this cover. And it's got this very cool little little thing on the side, on the spine, an illustration of our characters behind a window. And it's got illustrations, you know, with people, you know, lying insensible, you know, along the way. And it's, it's got 16 illustrations by Harry Roundtree. And it's, it's not as good as The Lost World, but it's entertaining. And uh, here's more people lying insensible, etc. And And it's just, you know, but, but Conan Doyle, Professor Challenger was one of his favorite characters that he created, justifiably so. And this is a very, very, very fun book. Here's Professor Challenger's with uh, some of the other characters. And, uh, you know, just a really cool book from the early early years of the 20th century. Uh, that book's over 100 years old. Then this is actually a new book. It's called The Premonitions Bureau. And it's a true story about people who were recruited to be psychics and out of, like, mental institutions, etc. <clears throat> and so I started reading it. It was... At first, I thought from the title, it looked, I thought it was like a science fiction novel, and it turned out to be a true story. I thought, well, i got to check this out. So it comes home. And then Julian Barnes, who's a winner of the Booker Prize, he wrote this new book called Elizabeth Finch. About It's a novel about a, a female teacher who uh, is well-remembered by her students. And then you take off the dust jacket, and it's got this cool photo of, a woman, of, of Elizabeth Finch looking away from the reader. And uh, it's just very well-written, very interesting. It deals with philosophy and teaching and all these different issues and uh you know again there's where we stay in Hampstead there's a bookstore a new bookstore nearby that has really great stuff and so I always buy a few books from them as well and uh I, I really like this I've, I've been reading it this is again from Hay on Why this is the first British edition of The Green Hills of Earth by Heinlein one of the great classics of science fiction and it's a collection of short stories set in a future history that that uh, Heinlein came up with, some of which he ended up writing, some of which not. And that's uh, the blind singer of the spaceways, Riesling, in the story, the title story of the book, The Green Hills of Earth, one of the classic, classic science fiction short stories. And um, uh, there's lots of great radio adaptations of this from the 50s, uh, X minus one, Dimension X. Uh, they did it on n numerous shows. Wonderful, wonderful story. And, uh, and, and this is a great, great copy in great condition and again not very expensive this, this is the fun part about going to uh Hayon Wai, which is a bookstore town because you find all these cool books here's a book by uh that i'd never seen before i'd never heard of it by kurt siodmak the great kurt siodmak now kurt siodmak was a german who emigrated to uh, america with his brother before world war ii he was a refugee uh, jewish and uh and he ended up writing for the movies. So he wrote The Wolfman and came up with, you know, though, even those who are, you know, pure of heart, uh, you know, can become a werewolf when the wolf bane blooms and so forth. Uh, and he wrote Donovan's Brain. And I actually met him at a Writers Guild retreat some years ago. He's, he, he had a very thick accent, but his writing, he really learned uh, American idiom. And you cannot tell from reading his writing that he's a foreigner. Um, he was he had a really wonderful writing style and uh and it was really cool to find this first edition of this book set on a space station uh and it came out you know around 1974 in 1974 and then i think probably within that 10 years after that i, I met him at the retreat and we hung out and talked and he signed a, a book for me and he was just one of the one of the greats one of the great writers and uh, donovan's brain is an amazing book and i'm sure this is too i'll be reading it now also the origin of Heian Wai as a kingdom of books was um, a book dealer named Richard Booth declared himself king on, on he, of Heian Wai and seceded from England. It was all in fun. It was like performance art, but uh, but this is him 
And this is his autobiography. He's sadly passed away three years ago. But uh, again, charming idea. And he, want, he created a bookstore town. The idea of a town that was dedicated to books and to literature, primarily used books, antiquarian books. And this is his story. And I look forward very much to reading it because, you know, he's, he's on the side of the angels. He, and now, of course, it is one. But uh, now also, I, and again, you find books, some books you find of editions that are of some of your favorite books, and then some books you find that you've never heard of by writers you really love. Like, this is Daphne du Maurier. Now, she wrote the novel Rebecca, which was made into the great film by Alfred Hitchcock, which if you've never seen, immediately go and see it. It's, it's terrific. And, um, and she also wrote the story, short story The Birds, which Hitchcock made into the movie The Birds, which is another great movie that you should see if you've never seen it. And this is a novel she wrote about Americans, the Americans conquering England in the 70s. And it's called Rule Britannia. And it's, uh, and it's just written very, in a very interesting way. And Daphne du Maurier, du Maurier um, she grew up in Hampstead, and uh, where, where we stayed in the north of, England, of uh, London. And, uh, and her father is Georges du Maurier. And uh, he's buried in the graveyard there. And she was just one of the great British writers and wrote many, many great, great works. And I will read this. And let's see, what else do we have here? Okay. This is very cool. I may have shown you this before. This is an early edition of Alice Through the Looking Glass. It was given as a prize to a student in 1911, and it was published in 1910. And there it is. It's got this, the, you know, two uh, for exams at the end of Lent term. And it's Shrewsbury School, uh, G.B. Ulmer, March 1st, 1911. And it's got all the great illustrations by John Tenniel, and it's, uh, you know, identical to the first edition in all things but the date, and uh, really a cool book. And then let's see, what else do we have here? Now, this is Hampstead in Light and Shade, a book from 1938, signed by the author and artist, Mary Hill. And this is her book, and here's her signature, and here's a postcard. She was a very popular artist who did scenes of Hampstead, as it looks then. And so this is a book that she wrote, and it's filled with illustrations. And she talks about how Hampstead is changing and what's the same. And you can actually go through Hampstead now and compare uh, how much of it is still there. And so I thought that'd be really wonderful to have this as a keepsake of Hampstead. And, uh, you know, signed by the author from 1938. I mean, that's incredibly cool. What else do we have here? This is Gentleman Mary Brunettes by Anita Luce. Now, if you look, let's see. Um... Let's see if I can, oh yeah, if I turn this like that, you can see a photo up on the wall there of a beautiful girl. That's Anita Luce. And she wrote, gentlemen prefer blondes as uh, a way of poking fun at her friend, Alexander Wolcott. And no, H.L. Mencken, her friend H.L. Mencken, how he would be drooling over these blonde girls. And uh, so it, uh, gentlemen prefer blondes is a great book. I highly recommend it. And this is her sequel, Gentlemen Mary Brunettes. And again, I'm going to get a, a facsimile dust jacket, but this is a, the first uh, first uh, British edition, and uh, from 1928, and the illustrations are very much of their period, and uh, and uh, it's just it's just got such interesting things in it, including il an illustration of Buster Keaton, which is fun because uh, Anita Luce actually wrote for Buster Keaton, and as well as D.W. Griffith and many other of the great uh, geniuses of that era. And so it's very fun, and it's profusely illustrated with a style that's very much in keeping with its its era. So, so just kind of a fun book, and it, it's a humor no, it's a humorous novel, and her work is uh, very um, fun, very very fun. And uh, and of course Marilyn Ro Monroe starred in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, but the book is much much better. And uh, here's the science fiction book club from the fifties. This is a novel by Philip K. Dick. And you'll come across Philip K. Dick hardcovers often, but this is an early one. And the weird thing about the Science Fiction Book Club of England is that they all have the same cover except different colors. And, uh, but, but, but again, finding it with Dust Jacket was really, really cool. And uh, let's see, this is the first edition of King Solomon's Mines. And it's a little damaged, but it's got a map in the, in the opening about a pot shard that leads them on their way or whatever. And it's... Uh, it's a wonderful book. It's one of my favorite books. 
H. Ryder Haggard. He also wrote the book She, which is just spectacular, one of the great works of fantasy literature. But um, but this is the first edition. In better condition, this could cost maybe a grand, but uh, this was just a few pounds, not much at all, 20 pounds, which is about like 30 bucks. And um, I mean, that's what you'd pay to buy a hardcover of this book now, a new one. And this book is from 18, let's see, what is it? 1886. And the fun part about this also is it has an ad for Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. And what makes this fun is he was reading Treasure Island on a train with his brother, uh, H. Ryder Haggard, in Africa, because he, uh, he was in Africa for many, many years. And he said, I could write a book this good. And his brother challenged him and said, well, can you? Well, go ahead and do it. And so he wrote King Solomon's Minds, which became a great, classic as well and it's it's a hugely fun book and I, I again it's another book i can recommend now that said of course you know you're always going to encounter the ideas that people had back then there might be a racist phrase or something but but again if you just go into the world of that era um you can you can enjoy them because because again um he's not being malicious at all in fact he, there the way, the way he mentions a certain word is he he has the character say i don't like that word and i never call people that word and that that's actually extremely progressive for the 1880s so then what else do i find okay this is another cool book a first edition this is lewis carroll of course is renowned for alice in wonderland and alice alice's alice through the looking Gra glass well after that he wrote a book called sylvie and bruno about two children and their fantastical adventures. Why, here they are, okay? And uh, so this is the first edition, profusely illustrated, and everyone says this is a dreadful book, that, that it has none of the charm uh, or wit of uh, Alice in Wonderland, that it's just totally a misfire. So I've never read it, and I've never even seen a first edition. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is you can see how they're emulating the look of the Alice in Wonderland, or Alice Through the Looking Glass. See how, how similar, same color, the gold thing with the illustration, all of that. <clears throat> but unlike the Alice books, which are thin and easy to read, the Sylvia and Bruno is like a tome. And, uh, <clears throat> but I may undertake uh, reading it. <clears throat> and in the back, it has ads for other Alice in Wonderland books. So it's uh, really interesting, you know, about that. The uh, you know, all the uh, the ways they promote <coughs> their successful authors, works by Lewis Carroll. You can see that. So pretty fun. So what else do we have? Well, many more uh, delightful things. This is uh, Frederick Pohl and C.M. Cornbluth were two, two of the great writers of science fiction. Uh, Frederick Pohl was one of the great editors and agents also of other writers. And this is the British paperback from the 50s of The Space Merchants. Look at that thing. A giant space drill with, with, with someone, you know, being blown back by it. Very, very fun. And, uh, you know, and so <coughs> that's another very renowned book. My friend Michael Reeves, who I'm working on uh, the Showrunners Network with, and who we, we wrote the uh, World Enough in Time, the, the Star Trek Sulu episode that's here on Mr. Sci-Fi together. This is one of his books that I've never seen before, The Burning Realm. So I grabbed it. It was there in England, there in Wales, you know, um, just sitting on a shelf. And uh, so I sent Michael, I took a photo outside the bookstore and sent Michael a photo of that. So he'd know that his work is still loved around the world. Now, this is another British uh, book cover that's really fun. The Wind of Liberty by, again, Kenneth Bulmer. Check out this, this cover. It's very cool from the 50s. But here's a question. He's got a space helmet on. He's got his, you know, pants and boots and bare arms. <laughs> And now it's sort of like, okay, what, where would he be where he would have to wear that? I guess a planet that has the pr atmospheric pressure like Earth, but not the same atmosphere, something like, it's, it's possible. It's possible, but it's very, very, very weird. So, uh, you know, but fun, very, very fun. The Wind of Liberty. Now we go to, now one, one thing I really love are authors who have to publish their own books. Now, for many, many decades, uh, or even centuries, uh, they, those were usually called vanity presses. It was sort of like your aunt has written this book that's unreadable and she, you know, hires some company to print them up. And, and there were companies devoted to this. It was mainly a way of kind of um, wasting money, wasting people's, you know, time, and no one would want to read these books. But 
But now, thanks to Amazon and the internet, that's no longer the case. And certain books take off. They're self-published and they take off. So vanity presses no longer have the um, negative connotation that they used to self-published. But some authors, like um, um, the author of Spartacus, who had come out of jail and was blacklisted uh, because of his political views, uh, he self-published Spartacus and it became a huge hit and got his career going again, Howard Fast. And, there, and this is The Common Reader by Virginia Woolf. And this is the first uh, uh, edition of this of the revised second series. And if you look, it says, published by Leonard and Virginia Woolf at the Hogarth Press, 52 Tavistock Square, London, WC, 1935. So they've started their own Hogarth Press to publish the books that they wrote and that their friends wrote. And so this is a book by Virginia Woolf, the famous Virginia Woolf, and it was published by her and her husband. And in the early years, they would actually be at the presses, running the presses, having the books come out, you know, with their team putting them together. It was it was very hands-on. So so with any given copy, you, you never know if Virginia Woolf actually, you know, handled the book herself. Uh, she would commit suicide at one point, which you, if you've seen the movie The Hours, you've seen that. Nicole went, uh, Kidman won an, an, an Oscar for playing her with this big, weird, you know, Wicked Witch of the West nose. But, uh, but uh, you know, but she is justly renowned as a writer, and uh, you know, another cool book. Here is Expedition to Earth, first edition by Arthur C. Clarke, his first collection of short stories from 1950. Let's see what it is, 1954. And again, he's a wonderful writer. Many of his stories hold up, um, and uh, you know, 2001 is one of my favorite movies, and. Uh, and Arthur C. Clarke was an amazing writer, and uh, and uh, one of the characters in Space Command is uh, from Sri Lanka, and that's because for many years Arthur C. Clarke lived there, and so one of the characters, her uh, her mom, uh, worked in on the house staff of uh, Arthur C. Clarke in the way we tell her. I think it was her grandmother. So here is another guide to Hampstead from the 19th century, and it's got ads in the front, and they're so great. So for instance, here's J. Houston Hewitson, Discount Bookseller. Look at that. You know, I mean, just, I love these things. And it's like uh, novelties in fancy leather and brass goods, handbags, purses, dressing cases, desks, albums, scrapbooks, letter and card cases, inkstands, photo frames and screens, music cases, discount bookseller, stationer, printer, bookbinder, engraver, artist, colorman, and fancy goods dealer. A stock of 15,000 volumes of new books at full discount prices. I mean, you know, how cool. And then there's a building society and, you know, it, it, but then it goes into the actual book itself, which is a guidebook to Hampstead and its histories. And this is uh, from 1898, almost the turn of the century. And it's a guide to Hampstead and it's got photos and, you know, and I, I, I ran, that's Hampstead Heath. And uh, I, I, you saw me post a video from there where I was running every other day. I would run in, in this beautiful parkland that's still there and uh, 120 years later, so very cool. This is this wacky postcard I got in Hampstead. Uh, one of these, like, you can be sure there must be a story there, and it's just great. <laughs> but it doesn't explain what that is or where it's from. It looks like it's maybe the 30s to the 50s. I think I may have shown you guys this before. Analog for a brief time was magazine size rather than digest size, and the great Kelly Freeze, that meant he had more room to paint a large cover and uh, I think this is a, just a terrific painting, wonderful cover. And uh, it's for uh, Sleeping Planet by William Burkett Jr., who I've never heard of, but, uh, but that certainly is a wonderful piece of art if you've never seen it, which you probably haven't. Then another, here's another great book. You know, a few more to go. And uh, hope, hope you're finding this fun. I certainly found it fun to find these books. This is Teenage Super Science Stories. And if you look closely, you see this guy's in a spacesuit with a camera and it's blasting away from his ship. And there's the Earth. He's photographing the Earth. We don't quite do it that way nowadays. <laughs> Thank God. Looks a little bit dicey. But this was stories written by Richard Elam, who wrote sh short stories for sort of teenage kids and preteens. And, uh, and this certainly is like, you know, eye-catching and fun. And again, from the 50s. Let's see. Here's a ticket to the good life. <laughs> so uh, I thought that could be of use to me. And... Here's a wonderful postcard of a cute dog, a painting of a cute dog that we'll put up because we are dog people. I think I talked to you about They, which is dystopian fiction 
about artists being outlawed. And uh, I'm going to read this. I, again, I got it at that bookstore, um, you know, W.H. Smith, right near where we were uh, in Hampstead. And, you know, it's fun to find a book you've never heard of that they say is really cool. This is a neat book by David Hockney, one of his friends. It's a dialogue between Hockney and one of his friends during a, a spring that uh, Hockney spent in um, Provence in France and it, they talk about his art and and uh, other artists work all the way back to the Renaissance and probably even before and it's just very beautiful and it has their it's sort of like their dialogue with a lot of Hockney's paintings and you know for, particularly for, for people who are in very gray very rainy England you know a book like this is a real tonic because it's got such bright colors and such you know wonderful this year this is a painting by a uh, you know, this is a, another Hockney painting. I like his work. His palette has always reminded me of Van Gogh. I think Van Gogh is the better artist, but Hockney is certainly um, cheer, cheerful. And I think there's something to be said for, for cheerfulness. Here's another of his lovely paintings. I mean, these are not dreary. And, and he has his own style, and he has his reason for his own style. And I'm glad he's still with us for now. He's old now, but he's still working, still prolific, and, uh, you know, Still taking chances. There's something else, another one of his paintings, very reminiscent of Van Gogh and also of Monet with the water lilies. And uh, but very cool, that's that's what the guy looks like nowadays. So he dresses in colors similar to his paintings. What else do we have here? This is the first ed edition of The Last Adventures of Sherlock Holmes from The Strand. And uh, again, because the book, condition dictates often a book's price. And fortunately, this was not in great condition, as you can see. But it's uh, it's a first edition, and uh, it's uh, it's it, it, stamped inside. It says William Ray, Edsel Villa, um, uh, Sale or uh, Tate. It's hard to know exactly what that says, but but it also says G. B. Bentley, the cloister eight eight the cloisters, Windsor Castle, Berkshires, and so that's again various owners of this book, and. Profusely illustrated. There's a very famous illustration of Holmes grappling with Moriarty when uh, when Conan Doyle killed him off. But then the, there was such an outcry for more Sherlock Holmes stories that he brought him back. <laughs> but he intended to kill him off because he was tired of writing about him. He pref he preferred uh, Challenger and other other books as well. But they wouldn't let him let him off the hook. He uh, he had to you know continue with Sherlock Holmes, which is a good thing for all of us because Sherlock Holmes, of course, is one of the great characters of all time but it's uh this is profusely illustrated and quite quite a lovely book and um and this has you know ads I, I really like the ads in the back for other books because most of them you've never heard of and uh george noon's limited that's the publisher of this book and they have you know travel in pictures and illustrated books and all sorts of things and you know it just kind of it brings the era alive and uh great book of the farthest north how fun. The Swiss Family Robinson, see? You can get a copy of that. So, okay. And then what else do we have? Here's Bram Stoker. Now, I recently bought a letter by Bram Stoker. And this is a book, you know, he was very private in his way, but they found his grandson found a, um, his great-grandson found a book that was a notebook, a journal that he kept Early on in his career, Bram Stoker, where he was making notes for stories and uh, and impressions and ideas, and it's just very, very, very cool, and um, you know, really, it really shows a a side of a Bram Stoker that had not been revealed before, because of course he wrote Dracula, which is one of the greatest books of all time, but it's sort of like he was a very quiet, um, not a showy person, and uh, uh, so he's so this kind of colors in the picture a little more, and. Uh, and again, I'd never seen it. It was at in, in Hayon Y at a mystery bookstore. So I, I bought it. It was very, very cool. Now, what's this? Let's see what this is. Ah, this is Limbo 90 by Bernard Wolf. Bernard Wolf, well, this is a British first edition. Again, I'm going to try and find a, a facsimile dust jacket for it. It's from 1953, first edition. It's one of the classics of science fiction, Limbo by Bernard Wolf. He was a bodyguard for Trotsky, and then uh, Trotsky was on the run from uh, Lenin and, and Stalin, well, particularly Stalin, and uh, and Bernard Wolf, Wolf was assigned to protect him, and he succeeded in that. And when Bernard Wolf left that job, uh, Trotsky was assassinated, but not on his watch. And then Elaine 
saw this a little a little uh, sidewalk sale sketches by Boz by Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens, when he was young, wrote under the name Boz, and this is again an early early edition of his stories and uh, lots of illustrations of Victorian London, and uh, just a fun fun book to read. Dickens is very 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 readable even today. He had uh, a real sense of what would entertain, and of course he wrote you know uh, David Copperfield and. Any number of great books, Nicholas, Nicholas Nickleby, and A Christmas Carol, of course. Um, this is Typhoon by Joseph Conrad, and this is, an, again, an early edition, and it was published by the Daily Express Fiction Library. Uh, Joseph Conrad was a Polish guy, but he wrote, a, he came to uh, Britain, and he wrote, he taught himself English, and he wrote brilliantly in English, and uh, he wrote a lot of seafaring stories, as well as things set in the frozen north and Typhoon. Elaine found this book for a pound. And this book could easily be over 100 years old. And here's the map for Hay on Wye that shows all these wonderful bookstores and then describes what they stock in a matter of just a few blocks in this wonderful little town. Here's a cool book, Beyond Human Ken, a science fiction anthology from the 50s. And this is Adventures in Tomorrow. Wow. And again, it has books by... It has short stories by people I, who were my friends and mentors, Ray Bradbury, Theodore Sturgeon, and so forth. And their mentors, Henry Kuttner was Ray Bradbury's mentor. So it's, uh, it's just really fun to see these early, early editions with these wonderful covers of what they imagined the future would be like. And then here is uh, Hurricane by John D. MacDonald, another great book. And uh, here's, this is the cover for Arthur C. Clarke. And this is actually the American cover of Martian Time Slip. And let's see if there's anything else here. And then finally, an Agatha Christie book with Miss Marple. And that's Margaret Rutherford from the movie. And that's it. That's it for now, guys. So that's a pretty good haul of books, I gotta tell you. And to find them for like a few pounds each, it doesn't, doesn't, you know, it doesn't get better than that, at least by my lights. So that's it. So we'll talk to you soon. And thanks for everything. Take care.